Yeah, so maybe I bring um, a very diverse perspective. Um, I am currently in community and economic development at Hennepin County, but I'm talking less about that particular role and talking more about my previous 13 years that I had spent at the city of Minnetonka, where I was first exposed to Homes Within Reach, or um, it's sometimes referred to as WALT, the West Hennepin Affordable Housing Land Trust, so you might hear those names interchanged. But additionally, um, I am now a board member. So the mayor of Minnetonka about a year and a half ago cornered me at Run Club practice and said, hey, will you be a board member? And I was like, ooh, I better say yes or that 10 mile training run becomes very long. <laughs> um, but all joking aside, I really felt passionate about the organization, having worked with them for so many years as a staff member that saying yes um, certainly felt appropriate. In the mid-90s, the city of Minnetonka had put a lot of tax increment financing into making some um, homes affordable. And with that, they wanted some long-term affordability, so they put some deed restrictions with those units. As you know, during that time, land values were increasing quite rapidly, and those homes after a couple years were no longer affordable. So the, real, the city really felt um, that they needed to do something different to get more long-term affordability. So they created a task force of elected officials, um, community members, local businesses, and came together and eventually uh, determined that a land trust was something that they wanted to pursue. So then in 2001, Homes Within Reach was incorporated as a nonprofit land trust. So it, it spun out of a city task force and became its own separate nonprofit but obviously had very close ties with the city. Uh, so uh, Homes Within Reach serves suburban Hennepin County. Uh, city of Lakes Community Land Trust serves uh, the city of Minneapolis. So that's kind of the distinguishing factor between those land trusts. And the goal within Homes Within Reach is to acquire, rehab, and sell homes to those at 80% of area median income or less. And just a note, um, as you heard in CLT 101, and as you'll hear from the panel, um, CLTs are fundamentally the same, but there are differences in how they operate, who they target, that sort of thing. So this is uh, the perspective of Homes Within Reach. So now we are working in 12 suburban communities, and Homes Within Reach works with each community differently to um, really meet the needs of what the community wants. So in Minnetonka, Homes Within Reach um, worked in various capacities. Uh, they, uh, while the city didn't necessarily have an inclusionary housing policy on the books, they did in new development require developers um, to include affordable units. So in some of the early 2000s, they were doing uh, home ownership units before you know the market changed and become more rental, but they were doing home ownership and so we would say to those developers at the time, you include one affordable unit, two affordable units, either on site or at a separate site, and you sell that to Homes Within Reach. And they did. And so Homes Within Reach was getting um, you know, some housing units that were at a lower cost. Additionally, the city played the role as a grant sponsor. So as you know, to apply to, for MAC Council funds, you have to be a municipality and Homes Within Reach is a nonprofit. So the city of Minnetonka acted as a sponsor for those grant applications. And additionally, as, as Brian said, um, the majority of the time though, the city was kind of sat back and was uh, more of a supporter and provided funding. And Homes Within Reach in most cases, um, in about 75% of the time is doing the heavy lifting. They're going out, they're finding the properties, they're acquiring them, they're rehabbing them, they're reselling them to qualified home buyers. Really, the city just needs to market the program. They need to let Homes Within Reach know when there's other properties available. But I think the important thing here is that cities need to bring funding to the table, not only for the capital costs, but now as I'm sitting on the board for the operating costs as well. It's easy to say we want all of our money to go into the actual acquisition of the home, and, but you have to pay somebody to actually run the program. So that operating cost is just as important. Our achievements since 2002, we have, have, have acquired 150 homes and um, served 170 families. And the incomes have been quite varied. 
31% AMI, as Tara was talking earlier, really able to hit some of those really low income for home ownership opportunities, mm -hmm. which has been fantastic. And our average AMI has been about 59%, so very similar to what um, Carver County has done. And then 39% have been homeowners of color. So I just wanted to talk briefly about some of our unique partnerships and collaborations. Brian talked a little bit about the, the tax forfeiture property in Bloomington. This, the county approached Homes Within Reach about acquiring a tax forfeiture property. They have a program out there that um, does some rehab itself, and so the county um, brought that rehab in and did that and then sold it to Homes Within Reach who then sold to a qualifying home buyer. The city played the supportive role, brought in the funding, was supportive of the project and in the community. So that was an important collaboration. Uh, we work in Edina and the city is providing funding and support. The um, Edina Housing Foundation, which is a separate foundation from the city, has helped to provide some second mortgages to our homeowners. Uh, St. Louis Park, I know there's St. Louis Park staff here. Um, the city in that case, um, in one of the cases, we have a lot of properties in St. Louis Park, bought a tax forfeiture property. They did the rehab and sold the homes within reach. In some cases, um, homes within reach in that city have bought foreclosure properties, sort of like Carver County is doing. In Eden Prairie, we had a unique partnership with Hennepin Technical College. Um, where they actually um, constructed the home on, uh, I don't believe it was a city-owned lot, but um, it, they partnered with the city and then sold it to Homes Within Reach. In Richfield, we've had a partnership in the past with the Greater Metropolitan Housing Corporation, GIMMICK, to, uh, they worked with the city to find city-owned lots in which they can construct uh, new housing, and then in the end, Homes Within Reach bought that home. And then in Maple Grove, that's been another place where we've been able to do work, and that's been acquisition and rehab as well with city support and funding. A couple of pieces of advice for those of you working in cities, it's about education. That's my first piece. It's a big investment up front. Brian was talking, you know, $50,000 a home, and whoa, our, our policymakers were like, wow, that's a lot of money. You're asking $225,000 of us to do four homes? Wait, what? Um, but it, I put together this chart. What it did was take each of some projects where the city had invested tax increment financing and how many affordable housing units. Obviously, the TIF was going for more than just affordable housing, but that's what the measure we used. How many units did we do? And then how many years of affordability were we gonna get out of that? And then we did a per unit, per year cost analysis, essentially. So as you can see, Homes Within Reach was at the very bottom of that. It was the least assistance per year, per unit. And I think that really kind of changed the policymakers' minds about, well, it's a lot of money up front, but over the long term, we get our biggest bang for our buck. Uh, we talked uh, um, in the CLT 101, there was talk about the stewardship that um, a CLT provides, and that's certainly the backbone of Homes Within Reach's program. It's expanding home ownership opportunities. As Brian was saying, those that uh, work in the community or may rent a home in the community are able to stay in that community. It retains the community wealth. It preserves housing affordability. We're stewardship of public funds and um, you're essentially recycling those funds for future generations. And finally, it enhances resident stability. Um, in one of my roles at the city of Minnetonka, I worked with the school district, and that school district was really concerned about resident stability, especially in some of the rental homes, because those folks were changing homes so often that those kids weren't doing well in school because they would change over. By having, creating this affordable home ownership, those residents stay. Those kids have a stable home and they do better overall in their education. Um, education on wealth building, we talked a little bit of that um, in the 101. Yes, there's a cap on the appreciation at the time of sale, but you know, compared to renting, that's more appreciation than they would get. 
And additionally, Homes Within Reach has a capital improvement policy where they get 100% of the appreciation on capital improvements. Now, that's just not your normal rehab. That's not your roof and furnace replacement that we all do. It's those things that go above and beyond. And that was to incentivize homeowners to invest in their property, make it theirs. Uh, my second piece of advice is to build a trusted network of advocates. Um, we were, Janet and I were talking about as I was preparing for this, that people aren't going to fill out an application if they don't hear about your program from somebody they trust. The program's too good to be true. You know, I hear this in some of the business programs that I manage on a daily basis. You know, they're, they're skeptical. So having that network of advocates that can go out and say, yes, this is a good thing, um, certainly helps. And then obviously, um, it's crazy to think that we're still encountering NIMBYism for affordable housing, but I remember Janet calling me up saying, you're not gonna believe this. Um, in my, when I was working in Minnetonka, we had a mixed income community, and we had a homeowner who was waiting on her window treatments to come in, but in the meantime had put up some you know, bed sheets as window coverings and the neighbors went ballistic. I mean, really, uh, of all the things to be concerned about, you're concerned about that, that bed sheet being a window treatment in the interim. So having those advocates out there that can talk positively about the program is always helpful. Well, you talked about taking these, uh, uh, built, uh, these uh, properties and the homeowner uh, just steps in and, and does an upgrade to the facility and, makes it a better place. From a tax standpoint, how, is, how are taxes handled from, from a property tax? Are, are those waived? Are they reduced from a state or a local level? Where's that at? So the question was, how are taxes handled for CLT homes? Yeah, so CLT homes, they do pay the full taxes on the property. And, um, you know, working in Minnetonka, we had a separate assessing department, so we had to work with the assessors to, so they understood how CLTs work. They they had questions about, like, why is the underlying property owner different than the person actually owning the property? But they do pay the taxes on the, on the property. In thinking about uh, dispersing affordable housing across the community, even in already expensive areas, is there a role for a CLT to play in doing that work when there might not be tax foreclosed properties or other properties that are uh, lower cost acquisitions initially? I would say yes. With our model, we have homes like, when people say who lives in these homes and what do these homes look like? I tell them, look in the mirror, the homeowners look just like you. And then I will tell them, I can give you a street in Victoria, in Waconia, in Chaska, and I can ask you to drive down that street and look at the homes and tell me which one is the land trust. They're not gonna know. So that opportunity does exist, and I would say we're already doing it. I think Homes Within Reach is already doing it. But we bring value to the purchase. In, um, right now I'm working in Waconia on a buyer-driven model. So I will work with the homeowner, knowing what they can afford for a mortgage, and find the appropriate home in a diverse neighborhood for them. Um, and so that, I, I'm doing that anywhere within the city. So if the homeowner d is limited on their income to a lesser mortgage amount and prefers an older home, I might be looking in the downtown area. If it is a family that has maybe more than, more like 60% AMI and wants a newer home, I might be looking at a new development, new construction. So land trusts, really can work in lots of different ways. The idea of scattered site was something that the city of Minnetonka really wanted to see happen. Um, they didn't want a concentration of affordability um, in necessarily one area. And so for, for many years, anytime the land trust would find a property in Minnetonka, they essentially um, had to ask the city, is it okay, can I buy this property? Because we didn't want too many from a city perspective, we didn't want too many of those, you know, all together. But, you know, as, as Brenda was saying, yeah, you drive down any street, you don't know which one that land trust home is. And in fact, you know, some of those homeowners that have lived in that community for many years m may actually make less money 
than those that are, you know, in a land trust home because they have lived there so long. They bought at a time when it was affordable. So really, they're, they're the same folks that are already living in the neighborhood. And I would just add one more plug that when you're thinking about a, a home that requires more subsidy to make it affordable, that's when the CLT model is so important because when you're thinking about the cost per unit per year or when you're thinking about the ability for that home to stay affordable for the long term, that's the time to really be using this model. I've been thinking about, Al, we um, spoke about earlier uh, vacancies in these communities, in the manufactured home communities, when we spent all year last year trying to locate homes that we could afford to purchase as a co-op and then turn around and sell them to um, homeowners. We were very unlucky to come across anything that we could afford. And then if there was, was any available, um, the brokers were buying those. And so how do we find a way to maybe connect with the cities to say, is there any type of funding that you could help us with infill so that we are not losing all these families, we're bringing more families in, more taxpayer dollars, and helping them find ownership, staying in a cooperative where they're not gonna be displaced. So in listening to all your stories now makes me feel like I need to go to my city and say, is there anything available? And if there isn't, how can we find something? Versus always going to the state, because we are doing a lot at the state level right now. How, how do we do that in the city level? Is that an opportunity for cities to help us?